I brought a friend today. This is George. George is a leech. To be specific, he is a European medicinal leech. It's been very interesting living with George lately. Uh, it's the first time we've had a pet in our home that looks to us not as the provider of dinner, but dinner itself. <laughs> so leeches like George have been used for a millennia uh, for countless treatments under the sun. If you had a stomach ache, for example, uh, you would have leeches applied to your belly. If you had a raging case of gonorrhea, you might have upwards to 50 leeches applied to your testicles. <laughs> so, anybody have a headache today? Would you like George to chew on your temple and fix that? No, I see a lot of shaking heads. Clearly, we have come a long way. For example, in the 18th century, tobacco was used as a treatment for victims of drowning in the Thames River in England, specifically tobacco smoke enemas. That's right. They used to think that blowing smoke up your ass was an actual... <laughs> legitimate way <laughs> to save you from being almost dead. <laughs> and don't worry, I am not going to ask for volunteers for that one. <laughs> for centuries, Egyptian mummies were stolen from tombs, ground up, mixed with myrrh and spices, and used as a treatment for a ringworm or the plague. And that wasn't the only kind of corpse and cannibalistic medicine out there. Human fat, harvested from the recently executed, was a treatment for things like aching joints and symptoms of rabies. They called it man's grease, or hangman's salve, and my favorite, poor sinner's fat. As recently as the early 20th century, radioactive water was sold as a health tonic and some of the drinkers became so radioactive that on their death, they were buried in lead-lined coffins. Like I said, we have come a long way. We know so much more about the human body now. There was a time when some anatomists actually thought that air ran through our blood vessels instead of blood. The uterus was once thought for well over a thousand years to be this misbehaving organ that ran around hither and thither inside a woman's body cavity, wreaking havoc like a dog without a leash. <laughs> and the only way to make it behave was to lure it into place with some sweet-smelling herbs waved down near her nether regions. We now have so much a better idea of things like infectious diseases. We understand better how things like Ebola travel through our bodies and across continents. We know that gold elixirs will not magically cure us of alcoholism, and that implanted monkey and goat glands is, are not going to uh, revive a man's waning libido. I mean, surgeons actually wash their hands before surgery, and believe it or not, that was not always the case. So if we have come so far, why is it that there is a multi-billion dollar industry of unproven, often useless, and occasionally dangerous treatments out there? So I have a couple answers for this, but first, a story. It's about me and my hair. So for a couple decades now, I am the person responsible in my household for leaving wads of hair in the shower drain. Call it genetics, call it telogen effluvium, which is a fancy word for my hair sheds and cycles so much, um, more than a golden retriever. <laughs> but what I do know is that when I flip open my computer, these ads will pop up because the all-knowing internet knows me better than I know myself. <laughs> and it'll try to sell me these new hair shampoos and vitamins and laser cannons that promise to turn me into Chewbacca if I just click on the clickbait and hand over my credit card. Now, depending on how much hair I've been shedding that morning, I might actually click on some of them. I might even buy some of them. So here's a little context. I am a practicing physician of internal medicine. I know how to do 
a medical literature search. And I know how to read that medical literature better than the average American. It's part of my job. With my co-author, Nate Peterson, we actually wrote an entire book on the history of quack medicine. So in a nutshell, when it comes to hair loss schemes, I really should know better. So why is it that all of us can be so susceptible to these unproven and occasionally fraudulent quack remedies out there now? Well, there's one, there's one obvious reason, which is that you know, we don't know everything about the human body. As a result of that, we don't have a cure for everything that can go wrong in it. And that leaves a lot of room for quacks to fill the void with their products. A second reason is bias. So bias is this incredibly powerful force that affects every single one of us. Let's say, for instance, you really want to lose some weight, and your two trusted friends swear that swallowing tapeworm eggs will do the trick. <laughs> so you buy them too. That's called the bandwagon effect. Let's say you really want to work on your complexion, so you fork over $50 to pay for these great arsenic wafers. And after you've spent the money, you think, God, that was really expensive, but it's good stuff. It must work, right? That's post-purchase rationalization. <laughs> and those are only two of many, many different biases that we are affected by all the time. But here's the, more here's the more complicated answer as to why quackery is still vividly alive today. It's hope. Now, don't get me wrong. Hope is incredibly important. I mean, we can't wake up in the morning without hope. We wouldn't have eradicated smallpox or saved countless heart attack victims without it. I mean, it's one of the things that makes us so human, isn't it? I mean, George isn't hoping for good weather tomorrow or an optimal cholesterol level. <laughs> but hope can be a little intoxicating. And like certain intoxicants, it can alter your ability to critically evaluate treatments and cures that are out there. Sometimes, I wish the word came with a big warning label. Hope can be hazardous to your health. You see, our health is part of our identity. It's deeply personal. And when we are making decisions about our health care, it's not always a subjective choosing of this versus that. It is personal, and it can be an emotional process. And so when something in our body goes awry, and our immune system starts attacking us, and we now have a diagnosis of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, it's not the body that we thought we had before. And we want so much to get back to normal, or a new normal, as soon as possible. I know what it's like to give bad news. The biopsy result is cancer. It's time to talk about dialysis. And I know what it's like to receive bad news. Lydia, there is a spot on your ovary, and it doesn't look exactly benign. Aside from the shock of, how can this be happening to me? There's this overwhelming desire to find that normal, to find a solution as soon as possible. And so you take this potent mix of emotions, fear, feeling lost, and you add hope, which is so important. But it can be a little bit like wearing a pair of rose-colored glasses. And suddenly, when you pop open your computer and these ads are there promising you exactly what you need, exactly the moment you need them, how can you say no? So we, as physicians, have to understand that making medical decisions for for our patients might not be as obvious to us as far as the answer as we think it might be when they're coming from this place of vulnerability. And we as patients have to understand that hope can change us in ways that we don't expect. It can make us both our, both our best advocates for ourselves and our worst enemy. So going back to George here, I know that the subject of today's talks are everything changes. And in so many cases, it really has. I mean, we're no longer snacking on corpses or performing lobotomies. But until there are safe and free and easy treatments for every medical problem, then quackery is always going to be there. And as long as we have hope, then snake oil salesmen are going to feed voraciously on its optimism. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have hope. I'm just saying that your emotional state of mind might make George here a little bit more attractive than he should be. <laughs> Thank you very much.